Yes, sir, she slipped away. She escaped. Uh. And she went, the very series about where she went, but she may have gone to Lundy, or a little island out there somewhere, and she hung out for a year or so out there, and then she was a Scandinavian lady, so she went back eventually. Very interesting, her story, actually. Right, oh, okay. If you go to St. Olaf's Church, which is in Fourth Street, that's the, her territory, really. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a story that she named it St. Olaf's, because um, St. Olaf was a Norwegian king. But I heard somebody say that she was Danish and she never would have... They hated each other. <laughs> <laughs> and they, she never would have given a Norwegian... Uh, uh, that, that, uh, Scandinavian. And the Moon in Boy, what happened to him? Let's let's say it was alright. I mean, let's not. I mean, <laughs> the brave lad. Yeah, right. Called John Patch. Is it John? Yeah, John. And uh, he had made quite a bit of money uh, treating the royal family when they were in exile um, uh, in the um, in Paris when they were out there before they the, the Stuarts came back. Anyway. He was a good surgeon, and he was obviously wealthy. He built this lovely house, Rouge Mont House. It's it's actually going up for grabs. If you want to buy it, it's for sale. Uh, maybe next week. Next month. <laughs> maybe next month. Yes. When you get your piggy bank. Well spotted. See, that's the city wall, and that goes up and around on the outside. But this is the inner wall of the garrison in there. But right. You see what I mean? So that's that is the city wall. And of course, that little hole was made in the 18th century, quite relatively recently. Right. And you can see here the great, lovely sweep, the lovely sweep of the moat, right. where they've had Shakespeare in the park in summer months mm. out here. It's really lovely. Mm. And the primroses make it look just mm. fine. So we're going to walk up through the park and enjoy it, and then um, past the museum and dive into a medieval street. I can't get to the base, I can't climb up. It's getting a bit old, isn't it? Yeah, but you want to see the fruit on there. Well, yeah. Each well, one of them is like this big. Mulberry tree. According to our friend here. Oh, yeah, mulberry tree. So, all the September time. Come back. Fruits are really exquisite. That's the main entrance to the Royal Albert Memorial Museum. Oh, okay. We think it's the back entrance. Yeah. It goes yeah. But actually, that's the main entrance. Yeah. The, it goes into Queen Street, which is uh, where those of us who know the museum from years. Uh, but it's been refurbished, re-renovated, and millions have been spent on it. And in fact, they got Museum of the Year Award 2012. You, you probably noticed, I'm sure, that is the wall, the city wall, wall within the city wall again. It's a bit there. But behind us is part of the university. Now, when this was built in 1868, in the name of Albert, who was a great lover of culture and science, it was the first library in Exeter, the Graham. But the forerunner, I suppose, of the Exeter University, which is the 1920s, this is an offshoot of the University of London, and this was the building, it's rather fine. But it, it, you see, it took a long time for Exeter to get into this, because remember, Exeter is a merchant city. It's, it's, uh, Elizabeth I gave it its motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. But the merchants, I think, quite, quite naturally would say, always faithful to us, always faithful to Exeter. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> so we're getting down now to Gandhi Street, and we'll talk again. I, I say that I think, I think you know, they, they were such merchants, these cats. <laughs> they, they were not going to. So. This is Gandhi Street. Oh, oh wait a minute, mind. there's a car. It would be, wouldn't it? Just as when. <laughs> That's so <laughs> Probably not. It hasn't been a car to push the car from that. Here we are. Now, we're we, we coming to Gandhi Street, which, um, if you use your imagination, you can imagine is a medieval street. Of course, it's changed quite a bit, but you get the idea. It's much narrower. It was the. Um, Exeter was very wealthy, getting more and more wealthy in the Middle Ages, and by 1600 has, had hit on this stuff called serge. Have a feel of that. It may remind you of army uniforms or school uniforms. Now that is not felt, it's a woven cloth. Can you believe it? It's woven, Crikey. and then it's teaseled, and then it's clipped. And you could hardly believe that's a woven cloth. 
When Exeter hit on this, they were really making money hand over fist. Particularly when they got royal assent for it to have nothing to do with the chamber, which is the city council. So the merchants had leapfrogged over the city council. There were no rules. They were just making so much money. So at that sort of time, this would have been a part of a wealthy place. But this was the leather workers part of the street. Leather workers. So we've got entrails of creatures. They're skinning animals. There's noise. The smell. Um, there's rats. There's <coughs> disease. And yes, they would have had a central thing, as so many Devon towns have and West Country towns. They'd have flushed them out or just waited for it to rain. From <laughs> So, you know, there it is, um, called Gandhi Street because, talking about people, the richer people lived up by the high street, the poorer people lived down towards the wall. Gandhi was a mayor twice over, and he was called Gandhi Street after him. Let us move along the street. Interesting building. I should come over here, and then you're not blocking anybody. Yes, you may, not, may have walked past it many a time. That is the Freemasons Hall. Now, I've looked up the, the things. It looks like the Star of David and this and that, but these were really quite old kind of stars, emblems for spiritual values. I'm not, you know, I'm sure you'll do better with your research than me, but it, they don't necessarily relate directly to the Freemason movement. I'm sure you all know the Freemasons come from the Masons. You look at our cathedral. The, 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 um, the Masons were very powerful people. They built cathedrals all around Europe and they kept their methods secret, which is why partly it's still kind of a secret organization, I guess. But I've been in it and it's quite a remarkable place. It's a lot bigger behind there, as you can imagine. I want to talk about a person, because we're talking about people here, and there's a man, we might call him J.R. for short, he was called John Rowe. Rather charmingly, um, Mary and Joseph Rowe were, were a couple who lived in Exeter in the early 1700s, and I think it was 1737, John, their third son, was born. And they were members of the John the Baptist, um, getting a bit senior now, getting a bit tired, what's it called, the, uh, within the Freemasons movement, they have Lodge, the Lodge, the John the Baptist Lodge, which was a very old established lodge, and um, they were members of it here in Exeter. Now, their three boys all went to Massachusetts. And uh, John was probably the most successful of them all. He's a very successful merchant, ran in the family. They were very good at that. And so much so that he got his own ship called the Eleanor. And with two others, and you'll be interested in these names, um, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, both signatories. Samuel Adams? Both signatories to the uh, Declaration of Independence. But the and third, the, tea the third, tea movement, Samuel Adams, wasn't it? In, Bo in Boston Harbour? Yeah, Boston Harbour. We're talking Boston here, Massachusetts. Yeah. And there's a classic story of, of this extra man who went over there. He was married by that time. He was a very successful businessman. There's a place called Rose Wharf, still there in Boston. And he um, had a meeting because he thoroughly disapproved of being taxed. These people had got away from England. They didn't want to be taxed by the mother country. And of course, this famous tea tax. Mm. So what did he say? He, in this meeting, he said something like, um, I wonder how seawater will mix with tea. Just like that. And as you know, later on that night, blacked up faces, out they went, they rode out and they threw the tea off the ship. Mm. The Eleanor, his ship. Uh, they were so angry that that's what they did. And you might think they cut off their nose to spite their face because 45 tons of tea were thrown overboard. When I learned this as a boy, I thought, just a few barrels, symbolic. <laughs> but they emptied that ship. They went crazy. 
And that really was, I would imagine, the supply of tea for the whole of New England, you know, for the year. 45 tons. And they were very sparing with their tea. If you read about, you know, um, Michener's books and so on, lovely, you know, just a little pinch was, would do, and they'd try and recycle it, wouldn't they? It's a very precious commodity. So it was a big thing they did. J.R. Rowe, Exeter boy. <laughs> I thought you'd like the story. <laughs> so, this is a delightful story, particularly for the Australians, um, because we've got these uh, characters who were born in the street. David Connick. He had an illustrious time in the fighting force for the British in the American War of Independence. And um, the famous battle he was in. And anyway, um, he goes on then to um, set up what became Sydney in Australia as the Governor General. And then he went on to start off Van Diemen's Land, which is Tasmania, and set up the city of Hobart. By this time, we've got into about 1801, something like that. Apparently, he's sitting in a tent, a bit short of houses at those times, with pioneers with a bloke, and he said where he came from. And this other chap was 20 years his junior, George Harris. I said, my God, I was born in Gandhi Street as well. <laughs> so here are these two chaps, far from home. And strange enough, they died the same year, 1810. But did very different things, really. The, George Harris was a um, deputy surveyor, and so they were very important people because they were deciding really where's a good place to build, rather like the Romans must have done when they came here. Is this the right place? Do we have water? Are we there? Is it got left? Anyway, extra boys. Hmm. Because it was one of a whole series that used to, this is Urban Outfitters now, but in its, in its previous incarnation, you see those windows down there. Each window had a picture which was done by an artist, I think it's called Simpson in the 1970s. And it reminds us to talk about Bodley, Thomas Bodley, who was born in this house as a Tudor, young Tudor boy. And he and his friend Nicholas grew up together. Their fathers had fought together on the wall against the prayer book rebellion in 1549. So they'd become very good chums, the fathers. And the sons, so Nicholas, young Nicholas, was taken on as a friend of Thomas, and they grew up together. Then um, they were Protestants, and then Mary comes to the throne, and she sees life very differently. She's a Roman Catholic extremist, and they flee for their lives to Geneva where they get some of the best education available in Europe, Thomas and Nicholas. Let's see a little bit later when the boys are growing up what they look like. There's Thomas, Rodney. He's got an intelligent face and he was highly educated. And Nicholas, I think you see he's a bit of a lad. <laughs> and those boys came back when it was safe in Elizabeth's reign. Do you remember I said Elizabeth was very good at choosing people around her? I'm sure you'd agree. She chose Thomas Bodley for his intelligence. And she sent him to the Hague to be a spy. And after a, a while, I don't know, five years or something, he tired of this subterfuge of living spy-like life. So he came back to deputy. He said, I'm finished with that. And it's a lovely story, this. He was in Torquay and playing cards four-hander, and a woman walked in through the door, and he fell in love with her. He just saw her, and he was knocked over. He asked a friend to take his hand, and he walked over to the lady and proposed marriage. And it was one of the most successful marriages ever. And it was, I think, helped considerably, because she was very wealthy. <laughs> And um, so it was largely her money that went to the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which was one of the most famous libraries in the world. And I explained that Exeter contributed near for its library, all except the Exeter book. Meanwhile, the lad, Nicholas Hilliard, was a brilliant artist, and he became the court artist for Elizabeth. So they were both pretty successful guys. 
So I thought it'd be interesting to know, if you go into Urban Outfitters, go up to the top, the sort of ladies' fitting room. It's rather fun, you know, ladies sort of popping out of doors and things. I've spent every... all my time up there. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I bet you do. But every door that opens, whoo, on the door, are these wonderful pictures. Oh, so we've got the picture... Oh, that... oh they put them up there, I think. They put them up there. Oh, they've wow, saved... I didn't know that. They've done a good job. They've done a good job. They've done a strange thing on the wall. I don't know whether you see the enormous face of the wall. Yeah. But that used to be, I thought, rather a nice historical thing. But, right. you know, the big... Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Out of proportion. Anyway. So that's that. Now, over there is a plaque. Oh, and yeah. essentially, without moving, because you don't need to really, it's about um, um, a reluctant mayor of Shillingford in the uh, 1400s. And Henry VI was the king, and for some reason he said, you've got to be mayor, because, you know, whatever. Anyway, he was reluctant. Uh, but as a mayor, he, I think he almost distrusted his powers, because he demanded that the whole city should be his, including the church. Because you remember, the big powers in any town or city would be the monarch, the church, very powerful, taking tithes from all the agriculture, and in Exeter, coming up very fast behind, wool. Mm. All merchants. So anyway, um, Chillingford was uh, a bit reluctant, but he claimed the whole of the city once he was mayor. And uh, there was a, a man called Bishop Lacey who had a big ding dong with him. They had great sort of verbal battles in the town in the 1400s. The thing was, he went up to London a few times to plead his case, Chillingford, but he couldn't get anywhere because who was Bishop Lacey's, one of his best buddies, Henry VI. Oh, uh, right. So Henry finally said, oh, stick to the town and let bishops look after their own territory. So that's, that, that was the end of it. Um, you see the, the man in rather a fetching pink cloak. Oh, yeah, yeah. Looks rather nice, isn't he? <laughs> now, that's Leofric. We've talked a bit about Leofric, the man with the library, the first bishop. And that's a wonderful bit of sculpting by Harry Hems. And I think you'd be interested to know that that building, if you're trying to date that building, what would you guess, wildly guess at? Oh, well, not, not as old as it looks, though, is it? No. It's Mark Tudor, isn't it? It's a facade. Yeah, it's Mark Tudor, made by Jesse Boot of Boot's Chemists. <laughs> who, was, who was a bit fanatical about Mark Tudor. He loved Tudor. And in his workshops in Nottingham, he made a lot of this stuff and sent it down, no nails, all pegs, just as it would have been built. So dear old Jesse Boot, 1908, that is. But, so there, there's our near friend. Now here we are outside blah, blah, the, the Guildhall. And the Guildhall dates way back to the The municipal building has been in the longest continuous use of any in the official office. They took a lot of trouble to avoid it getting injured. They built a great big heavy wooden structure all the way around it. And it's extraordinary, you see the photographs, very protected, and they sandbag the windows, heavily sandbagged on the outside, hence it survived. Most of the damage was done. You see that to that side, on the right, green. Beyond that, that's all modern buildings. And you see St. Stephen's Church survive somehow, you see the wooden But most of it was, that was the bit that was, as you saw from the map. Your pockets here, it survives, you see. Laura Ashley. Thorntons, very old buildings, and this dates back. I said they started meeting here in the 1100s, but actually this building is 1400. When you look at the roof, it's spectacular. This was 1590, it's portico put on. So again, it's Tudor, and this is where, because it was a courthouse, if somebody was deemed to have done wrong, they might be put in the stocks, which are here between the arches. Stopped. And if you were well liked, I think you, they just people just came around and had a chat to you. You weren't well liked, probably got I mean, a lot of fun. But these are granite. 
How would you get? Yeah, right. How would you get the weight of granite? How would you bring it in from Dartmoor? Which is where it was. Incredible, isn't it? They think amazing people. Yeah. Thomas got some financial troubles. There was a debt that had to be paid, and the sheriff had to be just up the high street. And he drew his dagger and had a tremendous battle. And the boy killed the sheriff. Well, I mean, tired and under, you know, hanging, drawing, quartering, all of it. But no, he got away with it because he came before the judge. And the judge happened to be his cousin. <laughs> <laughs> so, he was sent to the army. Yeah. 18 years old. It's all about silver, what's been presented yeah. to the pen. That was production Exeter, Red Coat Tour, and the tour was People, Plaques and Places, scenes one to end on the first take on roll one on a Sony Handycam model HDR CX190E. On the 25th of the 4th, 2013, sound was in stereo, production company was ADR Films, director was ADR, cameraman was ADR, that's Adam David Reynolds. And that's a wrap.